We're going to continue with the cloud. I'm going to bring everything together at the end of the last one. I think I'm going to do one or two more. Then we're going to finish with the cloud. But I still got to touch on one or two very important things. You would see what we've done with the cloud. I know a lot of you think, oh, you must just speak about the cloud. But it's not about the cloud. It's everything regarding the cloud that I'm speaking about. You need to know why this cloud is so important. And you also need to know why this cloud has got to do what it's got to do. So that's why I talk, took you through everything in the previous sessions about what happens with the cloud in a storm. The lightning, the hail, the voices. I took you to the, the moon, the stars, and the sun to show everything in nature that's in your Bible that speaks about this, this cloud. What is, because in your Bible, clouds get used very often in certain ways. And it says something for you. So to this morning, I want to, again, not go specific. It's more of a recap of what we've done. But I want to touch on one or two things. Because what I'm going to say this morning is it's about what the clouds must be and do. If you want to be this cloud that's carrying rain, you need to listen this morning if you want to carry rain. Because only the rain can bring life, not the cloud. Even though there must be rain in the cloud, because you get clouds without rain, the Bible says. Eh? And they just get blown away by the wind. The rain, the rain, the rain, it's the thing that it's about in the cloud. All right, so you really need to understand why this cloud is so important and why the clouds is necessary. There's two that I mentioned there, a cloud and the clouds. Why it's important to understand why they are there. All right, so I said in the beginning we're going to look at words in the New Testament speaking about the coming of the Lord, when He's going to come, all those type of words. We're going to look at why and how it's mentioned in the Bible. So we've got a lot of scriptures to go through today, so I'm going to try and read through them as quickly as possible. Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered them, You are deluded because your hearts are not filled with the revelation of the scriptures of the power of God. So before I go into these things, I want to make this point. Afrikaans, waar is het ook hier? To antwoord, Jesus sê vir hulle, Jylle dwaal omdat jylle die skrifte nie ken nie, en ook nie die kracht van God nie. Alright, so, this, they don't know, you don't know. And this no has got two, mean, two meanings, but I don't want to go into the meanings. I want to show you here, if you're sitting here and you're not making time in the scriptures, they're not saying the word, Jesus here. They're saying the scriptures. That's your Bible. It's your Bible. You see there? They're talking about your Bible. It says there, if you don't have the revelation of your Bible and the power of God, and that power is not to do how you cast out demons and stuff like that. It's got nothing to do with that. We've spoken about that actually before. But he says you are deluded. In Afrikaans, um, you're a dwell. You don't know where you're going. You're just going through the motions, going to church, going to Bible study, going to fellowships. Um, and... Uh, You've got no clue what you're doing. And it's easy to pick up if somebody's got no clue. I'm sorry. It's very easy to pick it up. You can sit and look how good and do all the things that you think is necessary, but it's very easy to pick up if somebody's just there. And I can see they have no revelation. You can sit here for three years and you have still no revelation. You need, and like we said with the men, you need to invest in the Word. You need to understand, you need to get the revelation of the word, not just to read it like we did in years before, like we were taught, just read your Bible. No, you need to get the revelation of the scriptures. All right. 1 Corinthians 1.24 But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. All right. Maar vir die wat geroep is, Jode, so wie alles Grieke, Christus, die kracht van God in die weisheid van God. 
We need to understand this power, this wisdom of God. And you get that through the revelation of your going through the scriptures. If you don't read your Bible, you will never get the revelation. I don't read the Bible for you when I stand in front of you. I show you how you must read your Bible so that you can go read your Bible. Because if you don't, you're never going to get the revelation. You're never going to grow. You're just going to stay stagnant where you are, not doing anything. So this is a very important thing. Now, I'm going to read some of the scriptures you, you should know by now, but Matthew 17, I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. After six days, Yeshua takes with him Peter and Jacob and John, his brother, and brings them up high on the mountain by themselves. Now he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Okay? Um, and now says that Jesus for Peter, Jacobus, and Johannes, say, broer, saam knie my hulle op die hoog berg in die eenzaamheid gebring. En hy het voor hulle van gedaante verander, en sy aangezicht het geblink soos die son, en sy kleer het wit geword soos die licht. Ok, Matthew 17, when Jesus went up the mountain, we spoke about this so many times. I want you to note here, when Jesus was standing there, he changed in his whole being. He didn't just stand there and they saw, okay, he's standing there and something is happening. It was a radical thing that happened there. His whole being in the natural and in the spirit changed. His clothes, his hair color, everything changed. What was inside became visible outside. That's what that word means. I want you to see something really radical happened up there. And this bit in your Bible, Matthew 17, if people understood this, they would stop following lies in their doctrines because they don't have the revelation of what happened up that mountain. That was one of the biggest things happening up that mountain. For me, it's as big as a cross, what happened there. Because a lot of things happened there. And a lot of people just read it and they don't truly get the revelation of what really happened there, why the people came that had to come. But we've spoken about that before. So here he speaks of six days. But the three of them were, 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 went up the mountain on the sixth day, after six days, they went up the mountain. Only three were allowed with him. I've mentioned that, I'll show you now again. I want you to realize what happened with Jesus up that mountain. Let me explain it to you this way. Jesus showed us how to get baptized. You all agree. When he went to John the Baptist, he didn't say, you must get baptized. He said, baptize me. So he went through the baptism to show you that it's okay for you and it's necessary for you to get baptized. It's of utmost importance that you get baptized. Otherwise, you're just going to hang like this the whole time. You need to get those things to grow. It's part of your growth to get baptized. So Jesus went and he showed them physically by doing it how to get baptized because he knew we're going to have that too but he wanted to show you in a practical way how it happened and how it's done and he, Jesus will never let you do something he hasn't done it alright you get that now here in Matthew 17 he does something radical again why let's put it this way There's going to come a day, and you must get this revelation of what I'm saying now. There's going to come a day, just like the day when you got baptized in water, that you did what Jesus did because of it's part of your growth and everything that's important with that. There's going to come a day where what happened here with Jesus on this mountain on Matthew 17 is going to happen with you. He showed you, like with baptism, how it's going to look, what is going to happen, how it's done. Like with baptism, here's another image of something that's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. The baptism has, has happened. This not. That's why this one is of utmost importance because he made sure when he did this, there was witnesses. Three in the flesh, two in the spirit. Five had to come and witness what he's going to do here. Because the law, Moses, and the prophet, had to fulfill, see the fulfillment of Christ. Because the Bible says, I've showed you the verses, 
that those who have to witness the manifestation of Christ, and they came there and they witnessed it. Everything they did, everything the law, Moses and the prophets did, pointed to Matthew 17. The fulfillment, Christ taking all that stuff that they prophesied it, that they spoke about, it happened before their eyes, they had to witness it. They were not somewhere and it happened here on earth. They were witnessing this thing happening there. Do you see the importance? And it's so, so important that he had all those people witness it because you're also going to go through it one day. And we don't want to believe that. If I say to the people, you're going to be baptized like Jesus, yes, yes, yes. And I say, what about this thing? Because it hasn't happened yet. The other things Jesus did happen with you and with him. But this hasn't. And this is one of the biggest things mentioned in your Bible. And we miss this. It's actually the veil that's over your eyes. That's why you don't get the revelation of what's going on there. So, do you see why those specific numbers are used here? Only three were taken up. So, uh, Luke 9.28. It's the same story. About eight days after these teachings, Yeshua took Peter, John, and Jacob with him and went up the mountain to pray. So same as in Matthew 17 that's happening here. It's the same story. It's just in a different book. While he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. Do you see what it says there? And his clothes flashed like white lightning. Do you see there's something radical happening here? And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophet. Because the Bible said they have to witness this next thing that's going to happen, which they actually prophesied it. Moses built the te temple, the tabernacle, which was actually also a prophecy of what happened in Matthew 17, the Holies of Holies. Matthew 17, if you want to think about it, it's what was in the Holies of Holies manifesting in front of their eyes. All right? So, why then here in Luke is it saying eight days, but in Matthew 17 it's saying six days? Because there's specific numbers being used here. You will see the angle the two writers are doing this is to say something different. The other one is saying it from a one point and the other one is saying it from a different point. The reason this one is eight, because it's saying to you, this thing that's happening here is a new thing. Eight always speaks about new. I know how many people were in the ark? Noah. Eight, they stepped into a new world. Eight always speaks about new beginning, everywhere in your Bible. This is showing you what is happening here in Matthew 17, because it's the same story, is a new beginning, something new, it was never before. Alright, it's pointing the same thing, eight is a new beginning. That's why we are, all of us are entering into a new beginning. Everything that was prophesied took place the last couple of hundred years again. Everything in the Bible that was prophesied happened again. I gave you the teaching when I said to you, we had the Reformation, the first Reformation, saved by, by faith. It happened again on the earth after Jesus left. It all happened again, Martha Luther. That whole thing was emphasized. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, all those of baptism, Baptist churches, all those things have been reiterated on the earth again, been focused on the earth again, because you need those things to step into what's next. If you are not baptized, you're going to struggle. You're not going to step into the next thing. If you are not working with the Holy Spirit, you're going to struggle to step into the next thing. It's going to be a struggle for you. You're going to make it way easier if you go through the things because it's a way of walking this thing out to get to what happened here with you. All right? So, again, you took the three people, Luke and Luke, the three people up the mountain. We know, should know by now what a mountain means in the spirit. But I mean it's Peter, James and John. Those three. Peter, James and John. Peter means the rock. James. Um, James the one who follows and John, grace of the Lord or love. The, the disciple with love. And that's why I said that's what it means. Want you see how precise, I've spoken about this before, but how precise the Bible is why those three were taken up the mountain because it says something in the spirit it says the rock is the one who follows in grace in, in the grace of the lord 
I want to say to you, you sitting here, the clouds, the rock, Jesus, is the one who follows you in the grace of the Lord. See what he's saying there? He took those three people up because that's what he was saying, happening up in the mountain. Why those three? I think they had a more deeper, intimate relationship with him. He always took those three with him, none of the others. Those three were always mentioned first. They had a special relationship. They were not better or more loved, but their relationship. He doesn't love any one of you more than the other. But some of you love him more than the one next to you, beside you, at the back. See who's playing the role? You. And these three, he took everywhere, in special places like this place, one of the biggest places in the Bible, he took those three. All right. Die rots, die een wie volg, genade van die Heere, en die rots is die een wie volg in die genade van die Heere. That's what he came to do, isn't it? Jesus, that, that, what that three names mean. That's what he came to do. But he's doing it with you, and you must allow him to do this. So here it says, while they were praying, his appearance on his face changed, and his clothes turned white. I want you to see his whole body, his, even his clothes went through a, a process of metamorphosis. It changed. What was inside came out. All right, that's what that word metamorphosis means. Whatever was placed inside becomes visible. All right? Philippians 3.20 For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory. Who have ever read that verse and understood what it says there? I'm going to read it again to show you you've never read this. Who will transform, he's talking about the one you just, just in the previous verse, Jesus Christ. He will, is the one who will transform the body, your body, of our humble state into a conformity with the body of His glory. What how does His body of His glory look like? Matthew 17. That's what Matthew 17 says. His body got glorified. He's saying your body, the one here that is, 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 is working through decay, getting older, he says that body is going to be made in the same as His body. His glory body by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to him. In Afrikaans, want ons burgerskap is in die hemel van waar ons ook as verloser verwacht die Heere Jesus Christus, wat ons vernederde lichaam van gedaante sal verander om gelijkvormig te word aan sy verheerlik lichaam volgens die werking waar die rei ons alles aan homself kan onderwerp Something's going to happen with your body. Do you see it standing there? And it's not going to happen in heaven. It's going to happen here. Everything in your Bible says is happening here, not in heaven. What are you going to do with that body in heaven? Look good. Huh? Because that's what we believe sometimes. Most of us believe that or thought of that because we were told that. So you're going to get a new body to look good in heaven, to fly around in heaven. No, man, you don't need a body to fly around. You need a body to fly here on the earth. To be like when, when Philip baptized a guy and he could disappear from one place to another in the spirit. Not only once, whenever you must, you can do it. That's what that body needs. Change the way it looks like Jesus could change. All right? You, I want you to see there's a something, like I said in Matthew 17, there's a transformation happening. A change that took place in the body, in the fizzle, the natural body of Jesus. That metamorphosis that we spoke about. The, I spoke, remember previously we spoke about the worm dying in the cocoon and becoming a butterfly. That's what the word metamorphosis means, those three stages. So we are still in the worm stage. I don't see Jesus in any of you, the natural, physical Jesus. I don't see him. 
I see some of his character coming through in some of you and the way you deal with, but I don't see Jesus yet. So I still see mostly the worm in all of us. But there's going to come a day when that worm, I will not see any of the worm anymore. I will see everything that was inside of the worm, the butterfly. That's Matthew 17, what happened on the mountain. Jesus, his natural body, the worm, the full human being, became the full butterfly. The worm was still there, but the focus was not on the worm. It was on everything that was inside the worm is the focus all of a sudden. All right, you must understand that. So, you are going to change in every physical, natural, spiritual way. How are you going to, why are you going to change? Let me ask you that question. Why are you going to change? Because you believe what Vanner is saying? Because you're an ABC church? Because you go to a cell groups and you do a lot of things for Jesus? You go out on the streets and you pray for the sick and you cast out demons? Are those the things that's going to make that you change to Matthew 17? No. You can do all those things and you can miss it all. It's got nothing to do with it. You can do all those things and when the Lord comes, you're not going to get a new body. When, why would you get a new body? Guys, you need to understand this because I in the beginning made this mistake thinking if I believe a certain way, this is going to happen with me. I think some of us, Aubrey, you might have also thought that in the beginning when we started with the hearing about this. That's why I'm saying because I thought it wrongly. I thought if I believe these things that you're hearing from me, then I will be one day, my body will change and I will become like Jesus that day. I'm saying to you now, it will not. The only reason your body will change and become like Jesus' body manifested is if you have a loving relationship with the Lord. That's the only reason. It's not your doctrine, what you believe. How many signs and wonders you do. None of that stuff will do anything to step into the glory of the Lord. Only, only your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ will determine if you get glorified one day or not. Full stop. I hope you understand that you don't make the mistake like I did for years, for I think like two years, I thought if I believe this way, then I can end up in that way. So I want to help you, you don't have to sit with those, with those that's a lie. Look at this one. This is something to know. The focus must always be on the one who will become visible in the clouds. Because we're speaking about clouds here. The focus must always be on the one who will become visible in the clouds. Jesus. It's a belief. I'm going to read it again. You must understand this. this must be, you must get the revelation of this. The focus must always be on the one who will become visible. Who became visible in Matthew 17 when he was standing as a normal person there. Jesus, the glorified one, the butterfly. All right? When Moses went up the mountain, who became visible? The father in the cloud. There was a cloud around Moses. It's about the one in the cloud. All right. Now I'm going to take you to Revelations. I don't know who of you have worked through the Revelation stuff with other church denominations, but I want to give you a different look at something here. I want to rattle some religious cages you might still have that needs to be rattled. Just in, I'm just going to touch on some things here. So here in Revelation 12.5 it says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. In say the manlike kindgebaar, listen to the wording they use here. It's very precise. What all the Nazis met the Eiser scepter so regeer, in our kind is weggeruk na God in sy troon. Now, here, man, child. That word, Let's put it this way. This woman is giving birth to this man-child. Okay? You see it says there, she's giving birth. So, let's, let's go here. Then you understand. That first word, man-child, man, it's chaos. 
in Greek. Some of you should know by now, Hairos is fully mature. The butterfly, if I can relate to that way. That was, who was, who was the Hairos in your Bible? Jesus. He was the only Hairos in your Bible. Fully mature. So it's saying there, as she brought forth a man child, the fully matured one, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child, the second one, look there, there's another one mentioned here. Do you see there's two words mentioning here, of a child. See how you must read your Bible. There's two children mentioned here, but they have got different things that they're saying. The second child mentioned in Revelation 5 is a technon. What's a technon? T, teenager. Why is it saying this then? Why is it saying, I'm going to read you the verse, and she brought forth a man child, the Haos, the mature one, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child, technon, teenager, was caught up unto God and to his throne. You see there's a difference here? What that word technon means, it's got two meanings. It's got the teenager, the one, and another meaning that the word technon's got is, um, where did I put it here? The second tecton also means offspring. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group form, in a group form. Why in a group form, that second child? It speaks about what? The body of Christ, the whole body. The teenager, the whole body, speaking about that. This, it's, it's, so the, you understand this, the first one speaks of the mature child, the Hayo, second one, the, the technon, the teenager, all right? And the meaning of that technon is also offspring, all right? The offspring of that, that came out of that. So what does it say if it's the offspring? It's speaking about a group of people, a corporate body, the body of Christ. Those who don't, don't know what a corporate body means, it's the body of Christ, working in unity, together. That's what that second one is talking about, all right? What is happening here in Revelation 5? This woman that's giving birth to this child, do you note if you read there, she has no participation in this child? None whatsoever? She's got nothing to do with this child? This woman? The moment he was born, he was taken to the throne, it says there. So she had no part. She... And please... For those that don't know, woman, what does woman mean in the Bible when they talk about a woman like this? It talks about the church. Woman is a picture and a type of the church, the bride. Woman, female, bride, church, we are the church. You get the good church and the bad church. This is the good church where this child's coming out of, this woman. Not a negative thing, all right? So this woman is a type of the church and she has got no role in helping this child, growing this child. She's not breastfeeding the child. She's not giving him food. She's got nothing. He's caught up to the throne immediately. All right? So, it's speaking about a mature, mature woman here. Uh, mature. This child does not look like his mother. This child's not speaking like his mother. It doesn't act like his mother. It doesn't think like his mother. It's totally different than the mother, this man child that gets born. This child, when he set foot on the earth, said, if I speak, you hear my father speak. He doesn't say like my mother, the church. He says, if I speak, you hear my father speak. I only do what my father tells me to do. All right? If you have seen me, you have seen the father. You see who that child is that she's speaking about there? The Hales, Jesus, because he was the only Hales in the world. We make some doctrines out of that thing that's scary, um, that they, people think what's happening there. So where is this son, according to Revelation 5? On the throne. He was caught up on the throne. Where is the woman in that verse? You guys must go read it. I'm not going to read that whole thing. It's going to take forever. You must go read Revelation 5. Where does the woman go after she gives birth? To the desert. The church. The mature church, God was staying to, to the desert. And if you read there, she's fleeing from the snake. 
how it's written that she's fleeing from the snake. He's sending a river of water to her to, to kill her. He's sending this flood. But if you read, you will see the sun helps the woman in the desert. He doesn't leave her to die. He helps her in the desert. It actually says there, by the end of it, the Lord gives this woman wings like an eagle to fly. Do you see how the prophetic wording is in there? What is it saying there? I wrote something down here that Om Yanni said. He said, when the sons, you, if you're going to be mature one day, when the sons are going to be revealed, like what happened in Matthew 17, there will be no need for an organized gathering. Because where you are, there will be a gathering. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're not going to have this anymore. You're not going to come to Bible school anymore. You are going to be the Bible school. Wherever you go, people are going to come to you. Like they did with Jesus. And it's not because of you. It's like I said earlier, it's because of the one in the cloud they're going to come to you. You're still the worm. You're the vessel. You're not the butterfly. They're going to come because of the beauty of the butterfly to you. All right? It says that you're going to be radiant with light, shining bright. Some of you know I've used this analogy before. What happens if it's dark? And you switch on a light. What does that light draw to it? If you're outside and you're stoop, on the farms especially, and you switch on a light after, and you keep a light on burning for a while, what comes to that light very quickly? Bugs and insects. Why are they coming to the light? Are the light calling them, saying we're going to have a gathering in a Bible school and we're going to have fellowship? No, it's something in the light that draws them close. Why do you think those terminologies used in your Bible? Because it's saying what we can see in nature happening. You're going to be that light bulb because of the butterfly and they're going to be drawn, the insects are going to be drawn to that. All right? I said, yeah, you must realize, think in nature. Um, when the rain comes, those of us that's been on farms and stuff, when it rains out in the field, what do you see after rain? A lot of insects coming. Have you seen how many insects all of a sudden, look in the town, tap, flies. After rain, sometimes you'll see a lot of flies in your house all of a sudden. They breathe out because of the rain, the water that came. All right? So think about it. So if on the day of the Lord it says, the latter rain is going to fall, the insects are going to come. Why are the insects going to come? Because of the rain, not because of you. You don't have to go look for the insects, they will come to you. All right? When you walk in the mall, where you, everywhere you go in your house, the insects will come because of what's inside of you. You will make, I said, yeah, you will make God's way known to people and you will preach the law to them. And it's not the law like we think, the, the Jewish law. What is the law of the New Testament? John 13, 34. I think I've got it here. Yes, this one here. John 13, 34. That's the law of the New Testament. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. That's what you're going to walk in. That law. Are you going to walk and preach? Again, Isaiah. We've read Isaiah. We've read so many times of Isaiah, Isaiah. After two days, while he, received, uh, he revived us, in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. All right? We've spoken of this after two days. On the third day, the seventh day, he will raise you up. Your body will change on the third day, the seventh day. That's what it's saying there. After two days, the first 2,000 years, it's already passed. 
But on the third day, he will raise you up. You're going to get the body that Jesus had, the glorified body. The butterfly is going to become visible. When is that going to happen? We have no clue. And it's good that we don't have any clue. Otherwise, we will make doctrines about it. I don't think we should know when it's going to happen at all. So we're stepping into this new thing, this number eight that we spoke about in Luke. We're stepping into this new thing, this third day. And if you, not to go too, too deep in this, but if you see, this is totally the opposite, this new day, what we're stepping into. What is going to happen on this new day? We're going to get a new body. You're going to walk and the insects are going to come to you. You're going to be nothing. You're going to love. If you look in the seventh church that's mentioned in Revelations, it's totally the opposite of that saying. So those that don't know, in Revelations, they speak about seven churches. And there's a lot of teachings about those seven churches. But the seventh church, if you look at their character that's written in the Bible, what I've just said is totally the opposite of that character of the seventh church. The church of Laodicea and Afrikaans. You will see it's the opposite. All right, let me give you a little thing to remember. Here's the, here's the seven churches that's mentioned in your Bible. You see there? Those are the seven churches mentioned in Revelations in your Bible. And we have a lot of teachings about this out there. I want you to re- just to realize something. These seven churches is actually just the character traits of churches. The characteristic, the trait, how they are. These churches, what, what's inside, what's going on inside of them, their character. That's what those names mean. Those seven. So the seventh one is the last one on the seventh day. What is the character of the church of the seventh day? Do you understand what I'm saying? We are in the seventh day now. So here they're showing you which church is there. So let's look at the character of the church. Religion of the seventh day. It says there... uh, Also, let me just say this. These seven spirits of these churches that are talking about how they act, it's speaking about the church that starts from Acts till now. Those, those churches started in book of Acts, the first one there. All right? Up to now, where we're in the seventh day. Do you understand that? The first church in the book of Acts is the one they speak about there. It's the first one. The last one that's mentioned there, Laod- Laodicea, is now where we now. There's only the character traits each church functioning. All right. So, here, yeah, Revelation three fifteen. I know your works. This is now the seventh church. All right. How does it look like? Does the Bible say the one that's functioning today? I know your works. This is the Lord saying to the church. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that. You were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Verse 17. For you say, I am rich. Isn't this what is going on in the church systems today? The church are saying, I am rich. I'm rich. I have uh, prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are rich, um, but they were poor, blind, and naked. You see, it's the character of the church he's talking about there. And that's exactly how the church looks today in Afrikaans. When you say, you are rich, and you are rich, and you are not going to break, and you know that you are what elendig and beklaanswaardig and arm and blind and naak is. Nie. That's exactly how the church looks today, religion. And I just said on the seventh day, you're going to shine, the bugs are going to come to you, you're going to walk in love. Do you see it's totally opposites? Can you see the opposites? What the church looks like today and how it should look? Go to any church and say to them something, they're going to say to you, no, we don't need that, we've got it all. We know what we're talking about, don't you come and tell me anything. We're well, okay. But if we understand what this is saying about the third day, you can understand that there's going to be a group of people that will only have one desire, and that's Jesus. That's what it's about. They will only have one desire. Um, if I can explain it to you this way, 
this is something that Umiani also used this example. I can probably think of anything else, but I'll just use his and I don't have to go and think about it. But he, he explained it like this. He said, you get people to explain to you how it's going to be in the church system that we are in. You're going to get people that will drink a pill, a tablet, because they've got what a headache or whatever. But they don't care or worry what's in the tablet. They will just drink it, that gospel. They will just drink that pill. They don't care what's in it. But then you will get people that would want to know what pill am I drinking, why am I drinking, what, how is this, is it going to have effects, negative or positive effects? Me, they want to know. In religion and on the day of the Lord, it's exactly the same. You're going to the people that will, people in the church today, as it says in the seventh church character, they don't care, they just drink the pill. I don't know what it's going to do, but I'm drinking the pill because I've got a problem. But what the Bible is saying, you should be on the seventh day, is that person that want to know Jesus. They want to know why they are where they are. They want everything. They want to know it. They're actually in the spirit. That's why we say we have a relationship, not a religion. A religion doesn't care what's going on. They just do what needs to be done. A relationship you want to know. You want to know the person that you are in relationship with. We still love the pool swallowing babies. We don't chase them away. We help them as we are led by the Spirit. All right? That's what we must do. All right. I can read, uh, read you verse 3 here of Hosea. Then shall we know if we follow, or let me rather read here, if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. The latter rain. Eh? We know the Bible says his spirit will touch all flesh. All flesh. And that's what this Hosea 3 is saying. That rain is going to rain on the earth. Earth, what is earth a picture of? Man. we made out of dust. It's going to rain on everybody the same way. But those that are in relationship, something is going to happen with them. All right? I said here, where the flesh disappears Jesus will appear the worm will disappear and the butterfly will become visible alright Psalm 72 6 he shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth alright he shall come down like rain again I'm talking about the rain where does rain come out of? clouds, we're speaking about the clouds I'm still talking about the clouds. I'm going to show you that all the things around this cloud. It's going to bring forth the rain, the latter rain that we need, that the Bible says. And it says there, on the grass as it showers the water the earth. Why grass? What is grass a type of? Your flesh. Go look in the Bible. Everywhere grass is mentioned, it says it withers away, it gets old and dies. Grass is always talking about your flesh. This thing. It's a picture of this thing. It grows on the the earth, the earth is, the grass is on the earth. All right, it talks about the flesh. But I want you to realize God is in every raindrop. Every raindrop contains Him. That fourth, how does this grass grow? This body grows because of Him. Here, yeah, Joel 2.23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Look what He's saying for what we must do. Are you that person? That one? En jylle kinders van Sion, soos die goed ek kom nou hier en ek sê, en jy, Willy, Estian, Sarel, Karen, van Sion, jy en wees bly in die Heere, jou hulle God. Doen jylle dit nou? Ons allemaal? Are we doing that? Who's Zion? We've spoken about that before. Who's Zion? Zion means God's dwelling place. That's what the word Zion means. God's dwelling place. It should be you. Where is God dwelling now? In you. You are God's dwelling place. And take it further. Let's see if we can rattle some cages. Do you know who Zion is? It's 144,000. It's not about the number. It's what the number represents. The 144,000 in Revelation speaks about a group of people who only desire the Lamb. 12 times 12 
it's speaking why it's not a physical number like the other people believe let's put it that way but it says they rejoice that and that's a difficult thing like I asked you are we rejoicing at the moment because we're supposed to rejoice but it's a difficult thing to do we all struggle with it there's none of us that can say yeah you're rejoicing the whole time huh I want to meet that person um, let me just get to this here I just want to read this for he has given you the former rain moderately and he will cause to come down for you the rain the former rain and the latter rain in the first month okay so he's saying there's going to be more rain here now okay what is that saying we are talking about clouds the rain that's going to come the clouds are going to do the thing that needs to be done okay what's what is in the cloud is going to cause what's to happen it speaks about here the early rain and the latter rain what does that mean what does early rain do who of you know what early rain do have you ever thought of it what does the early rain do early rain if you are a farmer prepares the ground gets the ground to a place where you can plant in it that's what the early rain does even if you look in the days in Israel back then when they wrote this they only planted after the first rain fell because then the soil the ground is ready to receive a seed that's why the Bible says, speaks about the early rain because when they spoke this they understood how the time worked and the, and the seasons worked to plant the people understood it back then that's why using that terminology here all right but it says uh, there's a latter rain gonna come later but it says in the beginning between the two the the early rain the latter rain it says there will be rain it speaks about three ways that that rain is gonna fall all right he says the early rain will come and then it will be followed by rain if you look at the months of Israel when the first rain fell after the first rain fell a couple of months after that it will still rain a little bit at a time so they would plant after the first rain they would plant the seeds and they know then as as the season gone they can plant because there's going to be continually little bits of rain so that will start growing the crop the harvest will start growing but what does the late rain do with the harvest the latter rain as the Bible says huh? it, the harvest could not ripen if it didn't receive the latter rain now you should already have a revelation of what I just said do you understand why they use that terminology in the Bible the, f- the first rain the rain that follows and the latter rain he's talking about the harvest when can we get the big harvest in the Bible says on the latter rain why because the harvest will be ripe then the whole harvest will be ripe now we see little bits and pieces but it's not the harvest yet it's part of the harvest all right understand that Zechariah 10 1 ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain I want you to understand every time you read this that you know why they're saying what they're saying so that the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field who's giving the rain there the Lord bright clouds what did I say is bright clouds divine illumination eh? that lightning that strikes out of the clouds we spoke about that a godly revelation I mean Peter here in Acts 22 17 and it shall come to pass in the last days says God I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh I will pour out my spirit on all flesh Peter had the revelation there he knew there was more coming James 5 again be patient oh we struggle with that eh? be patient therefore brothers until the coming of the Lord see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains you see how many times they talk about the early and the late rains the people back then knew what it meant but we didn't have no clue that's why we don't know what the verses are saying but I want to point something out here for you it says here look at those three things mentioned there 
talks about a farmer that's waiting for the precious fruit. What must you bear? Fruit. On the earth, it's talking about you here. This farmer is waiting for you to bear fruit. On that day of the Lord, on that day, He will make all the fruit come. Be patient. Just be diligent with what you have now. Don't try to have fruit that you should not have. A tree that wants to bear too much fruit struggles a lot. It will most probably die. So don't try and be someone that's super spiritual. Think you know everything. You're going to grow tired very quickly. It will only last a short while. Because that's not the proper fruit. You're pushing the fruit. You're not being patient. But he's saying here, this farmer is waiting. Wie is dan geduldig, broeders, tot op die wederkomst van die Heere? Kijk, die landbouwer wacht. Who is this farmer? It's the Lord. This coming, it says, Be patient therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Perusia, we spoke about this before. It's, that word means presence. Presence. You could be patient till the presence of the Lord comes. Where is that presence going to come? In the womb. It's the same that happened in Matthew 17. Where did Jesus' presence come from when he was standing on the mountain? From inside of him. It was already inside of him. The Holy Spirit. Everything was already inside of him. All right? Look there. Know this, people. The presence of God is in us. Uh, in us is still in hidden presence. It's still a hidden presence. And it must become a manifest presence one day. The worm, the teenwoordigheid van God is in ons a steeds a verborge teenwoordigheid. I can't see it yet in you. And you can't see it in me. Sometimes we get a little glimpse. And it moet eendag a gemanifesteerde teenwoordigheid wees. So one day it's going to come and it's going to stay. The butterfly doesn't fly a little bit and then turns back into a worm. It stays a butterfly. It's not going to go back to, the, to being a worm. And we wait for that. That's why we need to be patient. Don't run. Walk. But it says to be patient like a farmer. Because the farmer is God. It's Father. Alright? I said there cannot be a harvest if, it, if there is no late rain. It's impossible. They knew it back then. There cannot be a harvest if there's no late rain. Who's going to bring in the, God, the harvest on the day of the Lord? The sons of God. The mature bride. The rain ripens the harvest. The Holy Spirit ripens the harvest. Not you. Alright? If I go today to the George Herald and I say, I want to book the rugby stadium for a prayer meeting this coming Saturday. I hope 50 people is going to come. We've seen it. I've been into things and you pitch up and there's three people, four people. who ask later, we've done that. They organize a big thing and then three, three people come. Ten people come. People will not come. Unless I've got a title and a name and I'm on TV, then they won't come. If I can entertain them, if I can perform, I mean, you can go listen to some of the teachers on TV. They call themselves performers. You can go look. You don't have to believe me. Go listen to what they say. They call themselves performers for the Lord. But if you go and book the stadium for a prayer meeting, one of you go and book the stadium for a prayer meeting next Saturday. See how many people come. Nobody's going to come. One or two. The harvest needs to be ripe, and then you don't, have to, you don't have to call up a meeting. It's going to happen automatically. We're not going to do this way we're doing things now. It's going to be totally different. That's why I've told you before, I don't go to meetings of people anymore. I don't know if that person is, being, is right and har- is ready to be harvested. And I, I want to go listen to that person. We sometimes go run around and listen to people that hasn't even had the first rain. We listen to teachings of people that had no rain. Just knowledge. Think about it. 
And I'm not pointing fingers, I'm telling you to wake up and act in a better way in your journey with the Lord. I'm sorry, I know I burn bridges when I say that, but you realize what you're doing. It's about the harvest. That's why I ask every time when we have another seminar, the people must pray. Why must they pray? So that the rain can fall when we have that weekend. Because we want the harvest. We need rain to get the harvest. That's why we go into prayer before a seminar. That's why we pray. We need the rain to fall on that seminar. Otherwise, some of the people are going to go back and nothing's changed. Because they're not ready. And again, I've always said to you, who saves somebody? The Lord. The rain, the Holy Spirit, brings in the harvest. Not you. You can't do anything. But we need to get to the place where we can see somebody is ready to be harvested. But what do we do? We throw our pearls to all the pigs that hasn't even had rain yet. We love doing that. Then we feel good. Oh, I shared Jesus with people today. No, you threw your pearls to the pigs. That's what you did. That's not biblical what you just did. I know it's tough. I've thrown a lot of pearls away to pigs. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm the first one that did that. But let's get more mature and do things differently. Not the same way. Wait, you must see the rain has fallen on that person. The latter rain has fallen on that person. So that you can harvest. The harvest can come in. Alright? Because those people, if, they, if you teach and talk and share whatever with them, nothing's going to change. I'm telling you now, if there's no rain on that person, you're wasting your time. Don't, I will talk about that one day. Don't tell me you're sowing seeds. That's nonsense. That's not biblical. Because that's the first thing we go to default. Oh, and I'm sowing seeds. But we'll talk about that one day. You're not sowing seeds. Only the Holy Spirit can ripen a harvest. Only the rain can ripen a harvest. Not you. At the moment, we must be thankful for what, what we have. We can function and we can get harvest in. We've given the, the first fruit, the foretaste, the Bible says, and we use that and we get harvest in. But we must grow to become more efficient in this harvest. So we thank the Lord what He's doing at the moment, but we know we need more. We, let's be honest. What is going on outside? You and I know what we have at the moment will not save outside. Don't tell me you're going to save outside. You're going to lose a big, big, big argument. We do not have what it takes to save the world at the moment. If we had, the world would have looked way different. Don't tell me, oh, now we're busy, now we're going to change it now. No, there was other people that also had a time and a place where they had, did radical things. There actually happened more radical things 100, 200 years ago than at the moment. Yes, discipleship is moving, but that's nothing compared to what a couple of single guys did a couple of years ago. But we don't know about these things because we only follow the religious streams, what they did. We do not have the, what it takes, the capacity to change the world. We need the late rain. That will change the world that we can harvest, the bride. That day we can do the harvest and get the harvest in. Here it says, the next verse, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Listen to what it's saying here. And we struggle with that one. He just said the farmer is patient in waiting. And then he says, you also need to be patient. Huh? And the former we said is God, and this is you he's talking about. Things can happen at any time. The Lord can do whatever he wants at any time. You need to be patient and diligent on what he's given you to use. But be patient. So I'm gonna we finish with this. I just want to say this. We need the clouds to bring forth rain. That's one way of looking at the clouds. I'm going to talk about it a different way later. It's about what's in the cloud that's going to bring the harvest. You are not going to bring in the harvest. 
You can be the best disciple out in the world, traveling the world, preaching the gospel. You're not going to bring in the big harvest. The Lord is going to bring the big harvest. He's going to get all the glory, not you. Otherwise, you're going to go, I brought a million in, and he's going to go, I brought 200,000, and he's going to say, I brought five in, and then we're going to have this thing again. The Lord will bring in the harvest with the latter rain. It's about what's in the cloud, the rain, that's bringing the life. We need the first rain on people. We need that to get the ground ready. It's about the ground. Now, I'm going to do a different thing one day when I'm not going to do teaching about that thing. It's to do with the sowing of the seeds. The ground now needs to be ready. And how does the ground get ready? It needs rain, the first rain. You need to be ready when you get somebody that you want to talk to them. They must have already had the first rain when you start talking to them. If they haven't had the first rain, walk away. You're wasting your time. If they haven't had the rain, you can say and preach to them the gospel. You can do cups and cookies. It's not going to work. And it's not something negative. It's something learn and move on. Don't stick to doing the same thing over and over. You need somebody that's got the rain and you quickly pick it up. The more you do it, the more you will pick up. This person has received rain. I can work with them. There's growth happening in them. All right? But we need to get to that place where we, we the focus is about, about this cloud that's going to water. And what the water is going to do to the harvest. And you must be patient to wait for the harvest. That's why you that's been with me for a while, like, like I said to you, after I've discipled you and trained you for two to three years, I said to you, now you're on your own to do this. But ask the Holy Spirit how you must do this. Don't run every weekend out into the streets anymore. There was a time and a place for that. But now you do it, you be patient and you listen and you learn to act more according to the Holy Spirit, not according to what must be done. Because nothing is going to happen if you just run outside the whole time. Yes, here and there you're going to get somebody that had rain. I mean, if you have a shotgun and you shoot at a target, one of the pellets is going to hit. But the rest of the target is going to be destroyed. That you missed. And that's what we sometimes do when we go out in the streets. We, we have this shotgun approach to see where we're going to get somebody to save them. And you get the one, but you destroy more than what you actually have done. I know it's hard, but I mean, I've done that. That's why I can say it. I don't know what all of you have done, but I want you to get to the place where we trust the Holy Spirit, the rain, to point you in the direction, to show you. Holy Spirit must show you, I've rained on this person. Work with him. Otherwise, don't throw your pearls to the pigs. We don't know when this is going to happen, what happened in Matthew 17. When this cloud of glory is going to become visible. When you are going to become the butterfly. Or let me put it this way. When you, the butterfly is going to be visible in you. I don't know when it's going to happen. None of us know. But we've got to be diligent and patient in what we have received now. And are you doing that? Are you walking on what He's given you now? So that one day you are one of the three on the mountain. I'm going to say the last thing and now you must listen. There were how many disciples? Twelve. How many went up the mountain to see the, the Lord being glorified? Three. Where were the rest? Saved disciples. Not there. Relationship. They're not going to hell. It's got nothing to do with heaven and hell. It's to do with relationship. They were not on the mountain. Only three saw what happened. I hope all of us is going to be part of that three. Because you are going to determine if you are part of that three because of your love relationship. I mean, even the one disciple was called the love disciple. Why was John called the love disciple? It says in your Bible because he lay on Jesus' chest. He heard Jesus' heartbeat. He understood it. Do you know Jesus' heartbeat? Do you understand it? How he feels about you? How you must feel about him? Are you one of the three up that can go up the mountain? 
Are you like Peter the Rock that can go up the mountain? Because only those will, will change. And He will change you. Because you allowed the rain to fall on you. On this piece of ground sitting in front of me here. Alright. Next time I'm going to continue. And then I'm going to go to Moses' mountain. A bit more. Where the cloud appeared. To see what happened there. We spoke about the mountain with Jesus in Matthew 70. Next time we're going to go back to the old mountain. Alright.